Welcome everyone. My name is Lindsay Carroll and I am the Marine Education Coordinator with Oregon Sea Grant and I help coordinate programming out of Hatfield Marine Science Center, which is where I am sitting right now. And so we're excited to bring you a live animal interaction from our wet lab spaces where we typically teach students. And so I'm Lindsay and the other voice on our screen is Kate Goodwin. So Kate, you want to say hi real quick? Hello, I'm Kate. <laughs> She's another educator here and she's gonna, we're gonna be going back and forth and between the two of us, we're gonna bring you some really fun live footage of animals here. And so, we all, and so we are going to be exploring different animals through three different live animal interactions. So this is the first one. And so we are exploring animals that live in the rocky intertidal. And so that is a nice fancy word for tide pools. And so you can go ahead and type into the chat, let us know if you've been to the tide pools, whether it's the Oregon coast tide pools or tide pools elsewhere, let us know if you've been there before. And if you haven't been there before, we're actually going to play a video so that it can set the stage. So no matter where you're joining us from, you're going to zoom, literally zoom to the coast with us, and you're going to be here with us at the coast. And so, Kate, when you have a second, have we heard from anyone? Have, have people been to the tide pools, Kate? Uh, we don't have the information in the chat. We have a couple of right. hands are up. Um, and so Great. Uh, I think if you have a question where your hand is up, if you could use the chat to ask, ask your question, then I could verbalize it. Um, uh, especially also if you have any technical problems, you can also use the chat for that. Um, awesome. So some folks are saying they spent their summers in Puget Sound tide pools and Wonderful. others have explored tide pools in yachts and some folks are uh, addicted to tide pools, they say, so. <laughs> okay. Well, for those of us that may not have been to the tide pools before, so Kate, are you ready to launch that video when you get a second? Let's watch that video so that we can zoom our participants to the Oregon coast and we'll play this for a few seconds just set the stage of the habitat we are going to explore today. All right. Can you see it okay? Yeah, I see it okay. So if you see me look to the left, I'm just looking at a screen that's to my left. And so you're seeing the tide pool, the intertidal zone. So we call it rocky intertidal. You see it gets its name rocky because there are rocks. And as we're spanning across, we're at the coast, you see the waves crashing. You can see that water line, you know that it's low tide based off of where that water line is located. And so you can see the, the film person is walking and zooming around. You can see these pools of water. And so tide pools comes from these lovely pools of water. And so there's two, there's tides that come in and out. There's four tides a day at two high tides, two low tides. And so as water is low, it exposes these beautiful tide pools with diverse habitat, wonderful creatures. And so you can see this pooling of water. So we're going to explore animals that are found in these pools of water. There's all kinds of algae on those rocks. Sometimes it's slippery. Okay, so we're, you can see some sea stars right there. We're not going to explore a sea star today, but that is a very popular animal found in the tide pools. And so now that we have a better idea of where we are, this is a very changing environment, very dynamic. Okay, and so because it's changing all the time, these animals have to have adaptations in order to survive in this space that has dry times and wet times. And so at high tide, that coal rich, full oxygen rich water comes in and the animals can get oxygen, brings food. And then during those low tide times, it gets nice and dry. So sometimes those animals are susceptible to land predators. So it's a very changing dynamic uh, environment. So these animals have to have those adaptations to survive. And when I say adaptations, that's structures like a body part or behaviors like hiding that allow them to survive in their environment. And so we're gonna explore our first animal today. Are we excited? So we're going to take the camera off on me. We're going to zoom down to our first critter here. Whoa, <gasps> ho, ho. we've got our <laughs> green sea anemone right here. Go ahead and type into the chat if you have seen this critter before or if you've felt this critter before. And if you felt this critter before, can you tell us and Kate help me help me interpret what they're saying? What does it feel like for those of us who, who wants to tell our participants, what I'm feeling right now as I'm touching this critter. Yeah, some folks have uh, felt a sea anemone before and describe them as jello feeling mm. or sticky. Um, someone said stinging. And one person oh. says it feels like a spongy hug on your finger. Oh, yes. Is that what you're feeling, Lindsay? <laughs> yes, I am feeling. Thank you, friends. I'm glad you can help me interpret this. So yes, this is, they're sticky. It feels sticky to me. So you can see these tentacles. So this is a very soft creature. It is green. And so this is a green sea anemone. And a lot of folks get them confused with plants or flowers. They do kind of look flower-like, but this, a, this is an animal, I promise you. And these tentacles do feel sticky. So they have these lovely tentacles all around the edges here. 
and they feel sticky and someone said stingy. And so guess what? That stickiness that I'm feeling is actually the stinging tentacles, but don't worry, I'm okay. I have nice thick skin. Because, so these stinging tentacles, they, they're, the, they're stinging cells called nematocysts. That's a really big word. Maybe Kate can drop, drop that into the chat for you. Oh these stinging cells are where they get their name. So they're from Nidarium, phylum Nidaria, just like jellyfish and corals, okay? So they have stinging cells and they're microscopic. These nematocysts are stinging cells. So it feels sticky to us, but for a fish that does not have very thick skin, that is, that is going, those nematocysts, those stinging cells, oh, are going to stun and paralyze that fish. And so you can see that those tentacles, I'm sorry, yes, those tentacles are starting to slowly close up. I'm gonna give it a break here for a second. That's a stress response. So we'll give it a little bit of a break. But you notice, especially if I move right Yeah, here, Lindsay, someone had a question. Yeah. What is that white thing in the center of the sea anemone? The white thing. So are you referring to its mouth? Yes, the mouth. So, so that kind of looks like a belly button, right? Looks like a belly button, <laughs> not a belly button. So great question. That central part, now that we've talked about those tentacles where those stinging cells are located, that center part is its mouth. So I'm going to not touch that part, right? And so we're going to leave that alone. It's not a belly button, it's its mouth, but it's also, it's also where it goes to the bathroom. So even multiple reasons why I should not touch that part. Okay, so that's, that's <laughs> in and out one hole, okay? You'll Very see good. to the side here, we also have some strawberry anemones. They're nice and small. Okay, so I'm just showing you examples of sea anemones that come in all shapes and sizes. And you can see where the strawberry anemone gets its name because it looks like a strawberry. How many strawberry anemones are there? There's looks like there's several oh, all on see, one little rock. I see like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe about eight in my view. So you can see a lot, there's about eight that are on top of a small snail shell. So they love to hang out together. They like to aggregate together, right? And you can also see on these, on this anemone that's starting to close up, let me move it back. Oops, move it back this way. That there's this lovely petal disc. It's also very soft all along here. It's called a petal disc that um, helps this anemone stick in place. And so it's actually stuck to a rock. And so you'll notice in the intertidal or in tide pools, um, and actually, I forgot to say intertidal means between the tides. So that's what intertidal means. Um, they, a lot of these animals are going to have adaptations to hold on. So there's stickiness not only on the tentacles to capture food, but there's also stickiness on its petal disc so that it can stick to a rock. And that way it's not washed into the ocean into, so that way we have these beautiful, beautiful tide pools. So you'll see there's stickiness also on the petal disc. And you'll notice they're also different colors, right? And so there's the green sea anemone, there's the um, strawberry anemones, and then this is an example of an aggregate anemone that has a little bit of redness in it. Um, and so the difference is, is because there's this wonderful symbiotic, it's a big word for just a relationship, it's a mutual relationship between algae that's on the inside of its tentacles Okay, so there's algae inside the tentacles that cause it to have this beautiful color. So the different colors mean different kinds of algae, all right, inside those tentacles, making it those beautiful, beautiful colors. So Lindsay, we had a question in the chat about um, something else that's in the screen that we can see that's pink. Um, is that also related to the anemones that you're showing off, like the strawberry anemones, or is that something different? Yes, that I think we're talking hey, about. Yeah, that's a great question. That is coralline algae. So they're not related to the anemones. So that is a, a common algae that you're gonna see on the rocks as you are walking along in the tide pools. It's just so, it kind of feels crusty a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a type of algae. And so you'll see it's also on the rock, if I move my container back again, it's also on the rock right here. And some Great folks question. are having questions about how these animals fit into the ecosystem. Like what do they eat and who eats them? Oh yes, what do sea anemone eat? Or what do the sea anemones eat? Yes, they eat, um, they capture fish. So they'll use their stinging tentacles to capture fish. They'll also eat uh, mussels. They'll even eat sea urchins. Okay, and so when I refer to mussels, 
I'm gonna grab a mussel here real quick. Here's an example of a mussel that they like to eat. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll go ahead and I'm not gonna, I'll keep an eye on it, don't worry. <laughs> so mussels, sea urchins, okay, so they're stuck in place. So think about this, they have to have it, that adaptation of having those stinging cells helps them capture food. So they're gonna be capturing food that floats or swims by. And that's why they have those stinging cells to help them capture that effectively. And so the they're gonna be stuck to rocks. And so yes, they're capture food that way. Yes, Kate. And I was gonna mention that um, often when you go to the tide pools and look for these animals, you will find them underneath uh, big mussel beds where mm -hmm. barnacles are located, kind of low where they can stay wet if possible, even when the tide is out in tide pools, but also so that things from above on rocks could, if they get dislodged, fall into their mouths. So it's, uh, it's a nice thing for them to be positioned sort of underneath a mussel bed so that things that might fall down, they could just catch when, when it falls down into their stinging tentacles that can grab on and put into their mouths. And does anything eat sea anemones? Oh, that is such I a great don't. question. It's one of my favorite <laughs> animals. Okay, so sea anemones, think about this. They have stinging tentacles. To us, it doesn't feel stinging because we have very thick skin. But a lot of animals in this marine environment are not gonna have that thick skin. And so that defense mechanism that the sea anemone has is really effective. But there is a fun nudibranch. So a nudibranch is an example of an underwater sea, or it's a sea slug. And so the nudibranch, it's called the shaggy mouse nudibranch. And honestly, if you look at this other anemone right here, kind of has a similar coloration, all right? And so the shaggy mouse nudibranch will eat, they can actually eat the sea anemones. So the only kind of, one of the predators that we know of is the shaggy mouse nudibranch. And what's really cool about that nudibranch is it'll, it's able to eat the sea anemone. It's not impacted by the, the stinging cells. And it will actually, if you, if you look up an image, of the shaggy mouse nudibranch, it looks like it has these, gets its name because it kind of has these shaggy looking tentacle looking things. And so those stinging cells that the, um, that the nudibranch has just eaten will then go into its, into its body. And so that's how the nudibranch then defends itself because it absorbs those stinging cells. And so one of the known predators is the shaggy mouse nudibranch. Otherwise they are really good. And enemies are really good at defending themselves. Um, and do we know how long an anemone can live? Ooh, anemones, any guesses? Feel free to put into the chat, friends, any guesses? Let's see if we can get some guesses from our audience, Kate. Um, five years, 10 years, 13 years. These are our guesses. Okay. Forever, says the Forever. Team, right? <laughs> yeah, they don't have predators, right? So they must die of old age at some point. So I have seen up to 80 years, up to 80 years they can live, which is pretty impressive. Of the other kind of typal animals that we are going to explore today, that is the longest of the animals that we're going to explore. Do we have any other questions, Kate? Um, do, un, uh, do any animals in the tide pools have thick skin that protects them from the stinging cells? So have there been any uh, animals who have evolved to deal with the cells in the sea anemone and be able to uh, withstand those stinging nematocysts? Well, that is a great question. To the best of my knowledge, that's what the nematocysts, the stinging cells are what makes them such a great predator. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know the shaggy mouse nudibranch is an example. Yeah. Uh, you can even argue, okay, what about a hard shell? Let's think about this mussel. You would think, oh, a hard shell means it shouldn't, if it's hard, then you shouldn't be able to get the stinging cells through it, right? Mm -hmm. So you would think that a hard shell would be an adaptation that a type of animal could have, but because a muscle, M-U-S-S-E-L, has an adductor muscle, as in like your muscle in your body, to hold its shell closed, because the uh, anemone is stronger, right, has all those tentacles to pry open that muscle shell, that's going to mean that the muscle, unfortunately, will become food, because it's Yes, it has a hard shell, but it does not have the ability to stay closed forever. Because if you think about how long you can hold a box or how long you can hold something with your muscles as a person, doesn't it, 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 we fatigue, right? So even something that has evolved to have a hard shell is, is so the, my, my quick answer is, I don't know too many predators of sea anemones. And, and it's a good question of why animals haven't um, potentially evolved to survive, but maybe the, the nudibranch did, the shaggy mouse nudibranch did. Yep. So that's a great question. Um, guess what? It's almost 11. Oh times. my goodness. Are we almost out of time already? <laughs> How did that happen? Do we have time for one more question? Want to squeak in one more question? 
Uh, let's see. What do sea anemones do during low tide? If they're stuck in place, Ooh, though, and the that's a deep, great question. How do they yeah. behave? How do they protect themselves from the sun? Yeah. So this is one thing to be known to know to know about tide pool or this tide pool animal specifically. So there's all kinds of things. So you noticed how the uh, animal started to close the, its tentacles in as it's starting to get stressed. Well, another uh, uh, concept is that it's going to close its tentacles in during those dry times to keep these lovely soft parts. Uh, from drying out, you're going to notice that these anemones are going to be zoned. There's different zones based off of the adaptations that these animals have. So you're going to notice that these anemones are going to be at the bottom, like where the water is going to pool, right? They're going to be in spaces where they're going to have pooled water. But if there's an anemone that is uh, exposed during a uh, low tide, it'll close itself up or it will also kind of grab uh, sand and shells. So kind of like broken up shells from the um, surrounding area and stick them on top of itself. And so sometimes when you're walking in the side pools, you will notice that the, um, there's like a sandy shell looking kind of thing. But if you look really closely, it's kind of, it's the petal disc. It's this uh, section right here that's kind of on the outside here, closed in, but this, the uh, lovely um, shells and sand are, are sticking to it. So that way it, put, it packs itself with sand so it also doesn't dry out. So there's all kinds of cool behaviors that you'll see among sea anemones to protect themselves from drying out in, in this very changing environment. Right. And Great question. Uh, another question was, yeah, they can't just move away every time the tide goes out. Yeah, they're stuck in place. So this water, animal yeah. has a really- They can move a little bit, but not yeah. like with the tide. So yeah. Once they settle down, they are stuck for life. So that's why these wonderful adaptations of how to get food, how to defend themselves, given that they can't just swim away like a fish. Yeah. Okay. All right, friends. Well, somehow all of our time has run out here. We encourage you to come back and join us for our, um, let me get this on me here. Hi friends, how's it going? <laughs> so uh, we thank you for joining us for our first family friendly live animal interaction with our star of the show, not sea star, but the sea anemone, all right? And so we encourage you to check out the next talk about genetics and then come back and see us for our next live animal interaction that starts at 11.50. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy, we'll see you soon.